we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Buenas noches, and welcome to this year's 2021 Latinx Heritage Month speaker. My name is Cesar Berrios, and I'm the program advisor in the Multicultural Center. First, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who is here with us tonight. I know that evening events can sometimes be a little difficult uh, to attend because typically people are either studying if you're a student or working, uh, spending time with family or friends. And But whatever your reasoning is for being here tonight, I thank you. Um, I want to also take this opportunity to thank Vice President of Student Affairs, Dr. Kalila Doss, uh, President of the University of Southern Indiana, Dr. Ronald Rashan, for always supporting our Latinx students in our initiatives. I also want to thank my supervisor, Executive Director Pamela Hobson of the Multicultural Center for always supporting this event and each Latinx student that comes through our doors in the MCC. Last but not least, I want to thank my awesome colleagues, Associate Director Dr. D'Angelo Taylor, our Outreach Coordinator and Student Mentor, Ms. Jada Hogg, and our amazing Administrative Associate, Megan Poole, for always supporting our Latinx students, whether it be through programs or services. It truly takes a village to provide the support and the care that our students need to succeed. I've had the pleasure of serving as the program advisor in the Multicultural Center for the last five years now, and I can honestly say that this is one of my favorite events that I organize. And yes, I know I am biased, uh, but the reason why this is one of my favorite events is because during this event, we hear from individuals who not only identify as Latinos or Latinx, but who have done amazing things in their careers and who are unapologetically, I'm sorry, who unapologetically embrace their culture, their identity, and their history. This event is about celebrating the diversity within Latinx community. Latinx heritage comes from various places and some of it even comes from right here in the United States. When we talk about Latinos, we have to expand our minds and stop thinking that Latinos are monolithic. Each person is unique and so are the, their traditions, their heritage, language, identity, and their way of being. Yes, there are some similarities like the fact that Spanish is spoken throughout Latin America, but Another fact is that there are multiple groups of people throughout Latin America that still speak various types of indigenous languages. To me, this is what Latinx Heritage Month is all about. It's about celebrating the differences within the Latinx community. Additionally, Latinx Heritage Month is meant to be celebrated by all individuals, not just those who identify as Latinos or Latinx. We come together to celebrate the history, the contributions, and the sacrifices that Latinos have made in helping make this country, the Americas, and the world what it is today. During tonight's presentation, I challenge you all to open your minds and your hearts, reflect on where you come from, who you are, and who you want to be, embrace this occasion, and embrace yourself. Celebrate Latinx Heritage Month throughout the year. Don't wait until September or October of each year. Once again, welcome to the 2021 Latinx Heritage Month speaker. We have an amazing speaker with us tonight, and I hope that you are just excited to hear him as I am. Next up, we have uh, Francesca Lorenzo, who will be doing the introductions. Thank you, Cesar. My name is Francesca Laurencio, and I have been serving as the president of the Hispanic Student Union for two years. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce to you tonight's keynote speaker. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Edwin Steves. Dr. Steves attended Greenville College where he majored in social work. He then earned his master's at Washington University in St. Louis. And then he earned his doctorate at St. Louis University. Dr. Steves is the co-founder of Estra Estrategia Group and is also the market president of Prominence Health Plan. Estrategia Group is a consulting organization specializing in culturally relevant training and education. Dr. Steves has over 25 years of experience delivering transformational growth opportunities to a diverse audience as an excellent communicator, engaging in bilingual and bicultural public speaker, motivating international educator, productive administrator, and effective leader. 
Other positions Dr. Stavis has held have been Senior Vice President, Provost and Chief Operations Officer at Greenville University and Chief Executive Officer at RGVACO Health Providers. Please help me welcome Dr. Edwin Stavis. Great, thank you, Francesca. Can you guys hear me okay, Cesar? Can you hear me okay? Just a quick nod. Yes, uh, the only thing we, awesome. we don't see you. Uh, yes, the video says uh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I know I don't look that good, Cesar, <laughs> but put me on camera, my man. Let me see here. Uh, uh, While you do that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen so that I can uh, engage you here and, and allow you to do that unless uh, video sure. won't be possible simply because of technology. Like Cesar said, when you want things to work exactly the way you want them to work, usually they don't work exactly how you want them to work. So you have to pivot and you have to adjust. But let's see if we can get video. I think it's just have to click it on, on my name and allow video on my name. Uh, but uh, we'll see here in a second. As, as that gets figured out, um, Again, thank you, Francesca, for the introduction. Uh, you would believe that I actually wrote it uh, and just send it to you, but, but I appreciate all the accolades that, that are mentioned there. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you in moments like these, especially uh, in a month like the one we are celebrating, one month that is allocated to the history and also to the commemoration of the contributions and the celebration of our culture often manifested by perhaps a behavioral manifestation of that culture, language, food, or whatever the case may be, that is very concrete and you can touch it. But perhaps even more intrigued and, and, and intriguing and, and uh, complex is the reality that uh, our Latinx culture is incredibly diverse and nothing homogenic about it, as Cesar mentioned, with an amazing history, an amazing contribution, an amazing identity, an ethnic grouping that ultimately uh, has uh, shaped the way in which we have celebrated this great United States of America. So it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. It's a pleasure to be your speaker for this month and for this activity. Uh, it doesn't come with a true a realization that I don't deserve to be before you any more than anyone else. Uh, it comes with a sense of humility, as I understand that uh, you are taking an hour of your time uh, to be part of this conversation. And so with a grateful heart and a filled cup, uh, professional as well as personal cup, I come to you this evening with a sense of, of gratitude and a sense of humility. So thank you so much uh, for that opportunity. Muchísimas gracias. De corazón se lo digo, más que orgulloso de tener la oportunidad de estar con ustedes en esta noche. I will be talking to you on two different fronts. And perhaps if you can see my uh, my uh, screen, which I believe you can, let me uh, uh, just introduce this concept of how can you be an ace? In what ways can you... Uh... Dr. Chavez, could try, can you, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. Can you go ahead and try and see if you do, your camera works now? Let's see. Hey, all right. Let's see. Can, I, can you see me or no? Can you see me okay, Cesar, out of there or yes. no? Is yes, I can see you now, yes. Awesome, okay. So I greetings once again. I, I, I won't do the whole introduction, but once again, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity that you have uh, provided me to be with you in this capacity and, and, and talk to you a little bit about this idea of, of how uh, to be an ace. What, what is to be an ace in moments like today? Uh, the ace is oftentimes perceived and is oftentimes seen as kind of the top of the the top of the rank is the one that trumps, is the one that wins, is the one that everybody wants in a card game, is oftentimes seen as the first in line, right? Is, is the, the ability to be able to engage uh, uh, the opportunity to, to succeed and, and perhaps uh, to get to, to new levels. And so when we talk about being an ace, from my vantage point, I want to really emphasize a few things with you this evening that I think are going to be critically important as you continue to do the work and as you continue uh, to, to develop your college career and your, your, your identity in the context of being in a college setting or university setting. 
I'm going to leave you, I want to start with this idea and this notion of, can you drive your narrative? Can you drive the way in which you ultimately shape the way in which your story unfolds? No, you're not going to be able to have full control of how that narrative ultimately is created and how that narrative ultimately is forged ahead, but can you drive it? Can you have a sense of direction and commitment? Can you have a sense of full devotion to how your personal narrative as a Latino, Latina, Latinx in this country ultimately uh, comes across and how that is forged, how that comes about, how you embrace it, I think creates an opportunity for us to have a brief discussion over the course of tonight. So let me start with this statement by Maya Angelou, famous poet, one of my favorite, favorite poets uh, in, in uh, North America, uh, for sure, an African-American woman uh, who said uh, the following words. And again, if you're seeing them, you can see them there. There is no greater agony than burying an untold story inside of you. There's no deeper regret that perhaps you're going to have by the virtue of not unleashing your complete story about all of what makes you and all of what shapes you and all of what creates you, how that gets unleashed and how that gets unfolded and how you eventually are able to really drive a platform in which you create that narrative is one in which I want to invite you this evening to embrace totally. Otherwise, the agony, the regrets, the oh, what ifs moments will pile up in ways in which you may not find resolution or solace. So no greater agony than that story inside of you, that identity inside of you, that fulfillment inside of you, those vectors inside of you that ultimately lead you to that sense of definition, that sense of accomplishment, that sense of unfolding that sense of self-actualization is driven by that ability to narrate, to tell the story that ultimately forges inside of you. And so stories have to be told or they die. Stories have to be shaped in ways in which are created with a sense of understanding or, or they ultimately cannot be remembered. And so stories have to be told or they die. When they die, we cannot remember them who we are or why we are here, said Sue Mon Kidd a few years back. Writing is an act of courage. Creating an opportunity to tell the narration of your stories into a fuller narrative is an act of courage. And so ta Coates writes it this way, it is the job of the storyteller to say, to, to, to say things in truthful and direct ways. Maybe it leaves us sometimes despairing, sad, but for sure always reflecting reality. So you are a storyteller of your own construction, of your own narration. And so as you drive your narrative, as you begin to celebrate, as you embrace the totality of who you are in context and obviously understanding that it is a journey, then you can probably say what Ernest Hemingway once said, we are all apprentices in a craft where no one ever becomes a master. And that is the mastery of narration of your storytelling. Embrace the journey, embrace the opportunity. I motivate you this evening to embrace it in a way in which you know thyself, you know the identity elements and those vectors that ultimately shape you. You know your biases. You begin to see yourself in the mirror. You begin to unpack them. You begin to tell the story of the past and put it in the context of the present so that your future can be one that is forged by you. You begin to drive out of your strengths and how are you made up? Where are the things that shape you? How does your cultural context ultimately impact you? What is the nuance associated with an identity that not is only based on how others see you, but also how you see yourself. And that intersection ultimately provides a broader narrative. What is your history? Not only of your ethnic context and your native country of your parents or grandparents or ancestors, but what is your current history right now? 
What is the style or approach in which you embrace the nuances of life and how you personally began to actually embrace that journey? How do your beliefs get constructed, were constructed? How do your values begin to manifest themselves in behaviors that maybe at times you don't even see? That, friends, is the importance of understanding the knowledge of self as you begin to narrate the story. So this evening, as you embrace this idea of this month, as you connect in understanding how the, the nuance of the celebration of the month and the ethnic connection that ultimately drives the month, I wanna embrace with you three things on the personal side. And I wanna challenge you then a little bit more systemically, a little bit more uh, structurally on the sociological side of things as you embrace this evening with me together. So it starts with an attitude. It starts with a way of thinking, a way of feeling, a position, a way of understanding your disposition towards a particular situation. Let me tell you a story. I think it's a fascinating story since I'm close to my dad now. My dad is about 87 years old. I originated from the Dominican Republic, a great island, shared physical space with our neighbors and brothers, sisters and brothers of Haiti and the Hispaniola Island right in the Caribbean next to Cuba and Puerto Rico. Perhaps your geography sometimes fails you. So let me give you some context there. Born and raised there, came to this country about 16 years of age. And I came with a sense of understanding that, listen, this was the dream to come true. And this was the opportunity, even though it was not necessarily one that was written in the narrative. It was not my dream to be here. It became a dream once I was here was not my desire to necessarily come to the States. It became a reality simply out of the construction of what God did in my life because faith is important to me. And obviously what ultimately my parents decided through the process of other venues, perhaps even out of their own control, but it came in. And so I, here I am, I, I am in the land of the free and the greatest country on earth and all of the opportunities that come. And, and guess what? I, I don't want to be here. I really don't want to be here. This is not what I signed up for. And so language became part of that acculturation into the context. And it became a little bit difficult in that time, exposed and thrown into a full blown out English education, if you will. The life was becoming a little bit more difficult. And at that time, then I really began to struggle personally. And I remember a conversation with my dad. My dad said, listen, let me tell you something, very pragmatic kind of guy. Uh, eighth grade education, full of life in many different ways, with a sense of directedness and a sense of purpose, bigger sometimes even than the, what eighth, eighth, degree, uh, eighth grade degree ultimately provided. And in that process, what I said was, I man, this English thing is becoming very difficult. And this is what my dad said. My dad says, speak it. <laughs> it's their job to understand it a sense of attitude that ultimately created freedom for me to embrace not only this massive intersection that ultimately was creating a significant confusion and depression and transitional challenges, but one that freed me up to actually say, listen, go at it, go after it. Don't worry about how it comes out. Let that be their worry, but embrace the language speaking process and everybody else is going to be able to understand it. Attitude matters. So what is your attitude about your ethnic awareness and your understanding? What is your attitude about your, your narration and the construction of that narrative? How do you personally begin to develop a self-identity driven by a sense of an attitude that ultimately creates a way of thinking, creates a way of feeling, a position that allows you to embrace all of who you are? So tonight, friends, I invite you to embrace an attitude of growth. I invite you to embrace an attitude of curiosity. I invite you to embrace an attitude of determination as you create this narration of your story. The second thing I want to leave you on the personal side is this idea of concentration. To what degree are you taking action or creating power, generating power to focus your attention on what matters in this journey of your narration storytelling? What attention, what concentration can you pay? Can you deposit in your work, in your relationships, in your mechanics, in your journey, in this four-year opportunity 
that it is privilege for you to have in so many different ways. It is an amazing privilege and ultimately an opportunity that you should not let be to waste. The action or the power to focus your attention and your mental effort on the next, on the next chapter, on the next sentence, on the next opportunity, on the next relationship building, on the next network that you need to create, on the next difficult conversation that you need to have. Concentrate on the journey of a college education that is transformative. And as a result of that, you begin to then put your tentacles of growth around your process of this storytelling and this journey and this narration, and your book begins to be written. Your book begins to then tell a deeper story than not just what others tell you about who you are as a Latino, Latina, Latinx in this country, rather who you are shaping that particular label to be, how you want to embrace it, how you want to define it, how you want to concentrate around this idea of bringing life to a categorical definition of self that oftentimes has more power on ourselves than we on it. So concentrate, concentrate on those opportunities that this amazing, amazing university system ultimately have and that people around you like Cesar and others that he mentioned earlier are designed, are created, are positioned, are loving to be around you to help you shape that concentration. And then devote a vigorous, determined attempt. Don't let it just happen. Don't let it just be. Don't be the agony of not writing your journey story, of not creating your narrative, of not shaping the collection of stories that ultimately are going to drive your narrative. Be intentional, as intentional that you can be in the creation of the story. Don't minimize the opportunities perhaps that allow you to be in a position where you can learn and you can grow and you can stretch and you can find different ways. Don't settle for just the common thing of the day or the distraction of the friends or the opportunities that are not there. I really want to implore you that your effort be one that drives the narration of your story without agony, that drives the, the narration of your story without a, a, a regretful process, but that you embrace your lamentations and you embrace your praises in ways in which you are driving that story more directly. So your effort matters, your effort matters, your effort matters. It's you, things you can control. And that's one that I would love to implore you today to embrace it in a way in which it ultimately is determined and to embrace it in a way in which it ultimately defines you. I graduated from college at the age of 19, 20. I entered at age 16. I was a migrant into this country in that process. And when I began to engage the relationships that ultimately were gonna be transformative to this day, I go back to them as part of the deeper value network and put effort in ensuring that that network feeds into my soul, ethnic orientation, ethnic validity, understanding of who I am, and all of the things that come with that. So your attitude matters, your concentration matters, your effort matters as you drive the process of understanding how you're going to do that. So what is the content of your narrative? How can you, so Edwin, I love the introduction. Oh, thank you very much. I really, I'm fascinated by entering a narration, a storytelling exercise, a deeper, connection to who I am. I want to be an ace. I want to have a better understanding of my attitude toward to this position. I want to concentrate in the efforts that are necessary and those efforts to be given with no limitations whatsoever, but embrace them deeply. So what about that narrative? How can I put content in that narrative? And so stories that disallow the, the belief system and the heritage of a racial hierarchy of human value takes away from your narrative. Don't stay silent to this hierarchy of human value. Don't stay quiet to this idea of a pecking order relationship-based approach to who we are and who you as a Latino, Latina ultimately are. Stories that do not value a broader equitable position of the human story are stories that need to be challenged. And so you want to drive your story around 
Let me make sure, let me drive my belief system around this idea of dismantling, of jettisoning, of taking it down in ways in which you can take it down, but ultimately embracing the idea that you're going to have a better understanding of racial hierarchy in this country. You want to embrace it with a sense of passion. You want to embrace it with a sense of purpose, but you want to embrace it with a sense of knowledge. You want to also know that stories that demonstrate interconnectedness among individuals and systems are necessary. Don't bypass the relationship between you and the university in which you are at today. The systems, the policies, the programs, the services, the professors, the classes, the field trips, whatever it is that is designed in that educational journey, it is there for you with a purpose and interconnectedness. Your identity and your drive ultimately is determined by your capacity to narrate, to create the story, embracing such interconnectedness. Rejecting it creates a sense of dissatisfaction and lamentation and agony does not embrace the storytelling exercise for yourself. In other words, you're going to be frustrated unless you interconnect. So what does that mean for you personally? How does your Latino, Latina, Latinx identity get shaped by the interconnectedness with other groups and other people groups? How does it make sense for you to disconstruct your ethnic context, your Nicaraguan or Colombian or Dominican or Puerto Rican heritage in the context in which you're in today? How does that manifest itself when you take same identity values and same identity position and you put it in a different context? The interconnectedness of the systems and the individuals around you shape you. So embrace it, drive it, motivate yourself to be in a position in which you drive yourself to that. Stories that allow us to see ourselves in the other and stories that tell the truth about the future where there is a well-being for all and what it needs to be achieved are the stories that you want to embrace in your narrative. These are the stories that you want to drive. These are the stories that you want to connect to. These are the stories that you want to begin to shape. And so storytelling begins to be done in multiple ways. And so how do you embrace this idea of the narrative that needs to be changed around you and the systems that need to be changed around you? How do you embrace the idea of who you are, your self-identity as created mostly by the social elements and the social institutions and the social interactions that have been around you, but now you are in a position to begin to create your own story? What does it mean to truly like platanos or rice and beans? What does it mean for a Puerto Rican to actually really like red beans, but a Dominican likes the pinto beans and a Cuban likes the black beans? And if you stay within just that narrative itself, it just stays at the concrete. It doesn't go any deeper than that. Unless you invite someone to dinner, and then in dinner you have conversations around the interconnectedness, the power that exists and living with the systems around you to drive them deeper meaning about how black beans and rice define you. What is the true meaning of that amazing food? And so narrative change has to happen in multiple ways. So I take you now to a more systemic thinking related to your narrative construction, related to the systems around you that you need to embrace but you also need to challenge. Related to how your narrative gets created because of your identity, self-defined, but also your identity externally designed. How do you embrace this interconnectedness? How do you embrace this narrative change? How do you tell stories of systems changes that are not driven just simply by the individual relationships, as powerful as those may be, you cannot ignore your role in the impact of your identity as a Latino, Latina, Latinx in this country in the context of the system that you need to be in. So embrace it. Embrace the narrative change across all the industries that you see here. Embrace your major with a sense of passion and purpose and direction by understanding that entertainment and industry shapes that identity and that narrative. That journalism and news media shapes that journey 
and that narrative and that ultimately the, the, the collection of those stories. That digital media oftentimes in so many different ways in so many different forms provide you even the opportunity to elect or diselect a president of this amazing country. What is it published? To what school curricula do you subscribe? What are the cultural institutions that ultimately are created in order for you to actually drive that change? What are the monuments and the symbols that still tell a story, a narrative that is not appropriate, that is not safe, yet is maintained with a sense of power and control? So this idea of embracing healing and embracing ethnic relationships and embracing systems integration and embracing you as a person at Southern Indiana University comes in so many different ways. And so we create opportunities to work on matters of separation and, and you as a social worker perhaps wanna make sure that appropriate housing laws are in place or you as a, as a medical doctor want to make sure that equity of health is provided in the, in the communities in which is not achieved or is not actually gotten to or, or your arts and your culture dispositions and your, your paintings and your musics reflect a story of a people that ultimately have come out into an exodus of transformation and into an exodus of newness and enlightenment. You can drive that. You can shape that. You have the opportunity to embrace that more than ever in your life right now at the stage in which you're in. And so at this very moment, I want to say, tell the story, tell the story, tell the narrative. Which areas of this amazing social construction process would you want to embrace so that you individually continue to grow, you individually become an ace, but at the same time, you collectively design systems and challenge systems and provide opportunities around systems that create an interconnectedness of meaning and take away the hierarchy of human value. You have that opportunity. And in this month, not, 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 no better than Latinos to be able to do it. A people groups that is incredibly diverse, a people groups that do not necessarily subscribe to the same cultural values across, but that is united by often common language, but a people group that is driven by change and motivation and progress and in industry. And so you today wanna be embracing those external values and the way in which ultimately impact you personally. So you're a student and you want to get out there and lead. No one better than you, no other generation better than you to begin to create an inspiration for others, to create a change in our society that we still have not been able to achieve, to drive a new narrative because your identity shapes it, because your identity tells it, because your identity fuels it. So what inspires you? While students who become anti-racist advocates, advocates must navigate challenges from facing pushback for what can be perceived as a political activism to spending their limited time and energy on advocacy, many believe that the stakes are too high to remain silent. And so you cannot sit on the sideline. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. I want to be an ace. I want to be someone of change. I want to be somebody who drives it because I am driving it from who I am, from the belief about who I am, from the understanding of who I am and the interconnectedness that exists with the systems around me. Embrace it with a sense of power. Embrace it with a sense of understanding. Embrace it with a sense of action. Know where to act. Connect your ideas and ultimately drive your goals accordingly so that those around you can assist can provide you the, the, the platform, can provide you the support, can provide you the engagement that ultimately you're gonna need. You are at Southern Indiana University for a reason and for a purpose. Do you embrace it? Do you believe it? Do you know it? Can you actually really, really know what that narrative is gonna sound like once you're done there? Can you begin to create the chapters that are gonna lead that book into someone else's capacity to go right behind you and continue the action that ultimately you've created and the momentum of growth and change that you can do. 
you have that capacity to be an ace, to embrace a storytelling exercise that is motivated by change, to embrace a story exercise that is motivated by truth, and to embrace a storytelling exercise that is motivated by your capacity to interconnect with the systems around you. You can do this. And I embrace the opportunity with you. I embrace the challenge with you. I ask you to actually take down this email, scan this particular uh, survey that you see here on the screen. And I hope that in your process, you can say, hey, Edwin, uh, I heard you on October so-so, and I want to know more how I can develop X, Y, Z. I want to know, do you know anybody in New York City who is a corporate attorney and is interested in somebody like me? I want to know that I can be a vehicle to your storytelling, that you can embrace moments like these, not just for another hour of an event, but that you can embrace it to develop your attitude, your concentration, and your effort, and to create the appropriate interconnectedness that will change the systems around you for truth and a new narrative. Thank you so much. And I embrace the opportunity to answer your questions at this time. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Savage. That was very inspiring. Uh, I was literally sitting down here taking notes, even for myself. Um, I, I Just to start off as people start sending their, their questions and I do have a question for you. You talked about um, changing the narrative. Right. Um, but my question to you is, how do we as Latinos, and maybe even more so immigrant Latinos, um, change that narrative? Because it seems like that narrative that has been already been done for us by other people. And whether that narrative be that we don't speak English or that narrative that we take away more than we contribute, how do we do that? How can we change that narrative? That's a great question, uh, Cesar. I, I think you have to first understand um, where does the narrative come from, right? What is shaping the narrative? Uh, and I'll go back here so you guys can see a little bit more of kind of the categories of where narrative change ultimately comes in. Um, is it, and often driven by the power of journalism and news media and digital media and so on and so forth, you begin to see some of these things. And so you have to embrace the source of the creation of the narrative. In order to make the change happen, you're going to have to do a couple steps. One, understand the narrative, how it's created, right? What are the sources? Two, make sure that you are beginning to identify the truth sources of that narrative creation. Narratives are a collection of stories. So in order for you to counteract a narrative, you're going to counter tell stories that ultimately uh, provide an opportunity for somebody to see the, the, the juxtaposition of that narrative that was created at the beginning. So that's really significant. Second or third, wherever I'm at, make sure that you know the space in which it is actually taking place, right? The three areas that you see here in this model that I'm offering you is one motivated by, by separation, right? The, this idea that, that access to resources and inequities are created as a result of what ultimately that narrative is. So if you see those inequities play out, speak up, lead into them, find yourself full of information around it. No, it does not need to be a militant approach at all times. I don't believe that. Although at times it's so necessary to be because others don't listen quite enough to a passive presentation. My challenge to you is to make sure that you are embracing a narrative telling story process that ultimately is driven by understanding of how it needs to be changed, where it needs to be changed, and why it needs to be changed. Just changing the narrative for the sake of changing it won't happen because someone else is going to tell, tell a story louder than you can. So unite your forces, understand that process, but make sure you're embracing this idea of narrative change starts with truth telling and you want to tell the truth as often as you possibly can. All right, please use the Q&A feature if you have any questions. Um, 
And I do have another question for you. you talked in and maybe um, you talked about music and entertainment. Uh, and I think one of the slides, I think, I think actually this one right here that we're looking at right now, um, uh, you know, you talked about digital media, journalism, media, um, culture institutions. Um, and, and I thought, I immediately thought about music. And one thing that I've noticed in the last couple of years, and even just in the last one to two years, how much of an impact Latin music has been having on this narrative of, you know, like you were talking about and, um, you know, in, in, in embracing it as well as Latinos. And I mean, what do you think about that music impact that we, that it's had, that the Latin music is having in this country? Um, a pretty significant, obviously, uh, arts and entertainment uh, are major vehicles of cultural transmission. So as a result of being major vehicles of cultural transmission, they will always have a space and room for that process to be there. Artists are the most blunt truth tellers you can have. I look at the current controversies that we have around comedians or perhaps even uh, other forms of entertainers when they begin to tell truth, right? Uh, but artists can tell truth and they embrace truth and they really drive an opportunity to capture a story of the narrative that others don't that others can't. So if you are in the space of music and if you are uh, in that process, make sure that make sure that you are understanding. You have a vehicle in your hand. You have a tool in your hand that you can use it for good or for bad. And my encouragement to you is to ensure that you're doing it for good. And I see a question online uh, here written that, that what else has assisted in overcoming the fears of stepping into who you are? I think that's a great question. I'll answer that one as well. But this idea of, of, of how Latinos manifest themselves through cultural processes, right? So, you know, a Latino usually uh, on TV and there's some form of, of accent that's portrayed. Uh, oftentimes there are music elements that, that is driven by, um, by, by the individual there, but uh, uh, how do you break fears? How do you step out of fears? Well, the one is you, you, you gotta step out of fears with love. Love casts all fears. And that love first starts with yourself. You've got to be able to understand that without the context of you embracing your narrative and your story, unpacking it, embracing it, storytell it as from the mountaintop as to what that means and who you are, out of love and compassion and understanding, then oftentimes fears, false evidence that appear real are going to so much overwhelm you that you're not going to be able to drive that out. So start with that concept of, let me love self, let me love context, let me love others in that space that embrace then my capacity to be able to tell my story a little bit differently. That, that's really important and I think that that's there. The other thing that assisted me is depend on others, uh, not co-depend on others, but interdepend on others. Seek the voices of great advisors, motivate yourself to be there for a coffee moment with them and then ask the questions that you know you have to ask them. Do drive yourselves to your professors if allowed and perhaps part of the culture of a university and, and ask the tough questions to them. They're there for there, they're there for that. And perhaps you may not get some of the answers you may want to hear, but at least provides you a context to start with. Expand your network. Life is not a solo sport. Life is a team sport. And so who is in your team? Who's around you? How do you drive that idea? And the Latino culture is one that is pretty well positioned to be able to drive the tío and the tía and, and, and the vecina that's right around the corner that ultimately can actually shape us. I, I don't remember times in which our vecinas and vecinos had influence over our, even our racing of who we were. And so embrace that. You're not in a solo sport. You are in a team sport drive yourself to the network that's around you. So thank you for that question. I'll keep answering questions here, Cesar, because I see them here. So it'll be probably a little easier to do that. Jessica Carapia Cortez says, do you have advice for first-generation college students who happen to be children of immigrants as well? Yes, and she expands and says, I feel like sometimes 
we overwork ourselves or put a lot of our plates because we feel the need to prove ourselves to either our parents or our university. Do you think this is leading us towards the right path or is, or is it going, or is this going to affect our production later in life? Jessica, you're highlighting something really important. There is no other narrative that has driven me more and had at times has driven me to points of exhaustion, then I got to work out work, not just work. I got to out work everyone around me. That is driven by the narrative of uh, often uh, first generation expectations, whether it's college students or other like, it doesn't matter or perhaps the immigrant story that's here. So we want to put the worth of, thank you for allowing me to be here. So now I got to make myself worthy of being physically here. So I'm going to do more than you even know. I mean, how many, those who call themselves quote unquote Americans or perhaps United States of Americans can actually pass the citizenship course that we, those who migrate into this country have to take. The standards are always higher. The standards will always be higher. Some of them are self-imposed. My recommendation is tone those down, keep them in balance, find a support group that allows you to disconnect, create opportunities for the narrative that you're creating about yourselves in ways in which have spaces for comedy and sarcasm, not just drama and action all the time. Make sure that you have an opportunity to have others who speak the truth into your life in a way in which is not the burden that oftentimes those of us who come with that set expectations continue to add into our shoulders. But they stay there. Just drive the narrative towards something that allows you to be happy with, identify yourself with it, embrace it with a sense of pride, but decompress, have escape valves, have networks around you that give you the freedom to mess up every now and then. How do I build or work towards building my own confidence and shaping the narratives? You're welcome, Jessica. There's another Jessica there. How do I work towards building, uh, building my own confidence and shaping the narrative? Um, <clears throat> confidence is oftentimes a byproduct of competence and sometimes the, the opportunity for me to build my confidence comes out of the exposure, the repetition, the acquisition of information, the practicing of. And so as you build your practicing of who you are uh, becoming an ace, or how do your systems around you create an opportunity for you to tell a different story and manifest interconnectedness in that narration, right? then you begin to say, now my practice, now my competence acquisition creates an opportunity for me then to repeat it with confidence. Confidence could easily betray you. Confidence could easily mask quite a bit of the internal fears, which are okay, as long as you channel them and manage them accordingly. And so you want to embrace the idea of competence, the idea of practice, the idea of exposure as you are building confidence in the work that ultimately you're doing. What advice would you give to college students who are becoming in this time of social unrest? I would say, it's a great question. I would say, pause so you can see Grab the, 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 the competence that I just described, grab the information, embrace the knowledge that you need to see, embrace the history, embrace the identity, study some more if you need to, ask the questions, don't shut down in the process, right? Don't shut down in that process and find ways to channel your strengths, your identity well, and your process of narrative change in ways in which speak to you, in ways in which mean to you, are meaningful to you, in ways in which you can embrace and connect and deliver quite a bit of the elements that are there. So make sure that you are driving yourself in that 
social unrest is not new. See, these social challenges that you are seeing today, they're not new. They, they are going to be there. They will be there. They will be there into the future. As long as the human hierarchy process stays and the valuation of the other comes out of my perception and understanding of who the other is, we're going to have some of these mechanics. Systems still need a lot of work. And so social structures need to be influenced by you. They need to be driven by you, you, the generation that today, 10 years from now, will take over managerial roles and will take over leadership roles and will take over positions on boards and will have the opportunity to actually make change. They will come. And so you want to embrace it in that way. So nothing new in that regard, understanding that, then you want to embrace your competence and your confidence. You want to embrace your identity. You want to embrace all of that. It, it is something that I want to challenge you to not settle in. It's to say, that's not my problem. That doesn't affect me. That it doesn't impact me, but embrace the mechanics around you and the social activism around you and the social justice movement around you with a sense of understanding of why they're there without abandoning it, who you are in the process. There's a, Dr. Savage, there's a couple of questions or a few questions in the uh, Q&A feature if you see them, if you open it up. Beautiful, let me see here. Okay, all right, all right. Oh, sorry guys, sorry, Gabriela. How'd they come into the U.S. influence your identity? It's American part, oh my goodness. I, I, it influences in so many different ways, sometimes without you even knowing, Gabriela. Uh, often, right, you find yourself um, um, uh, trying to create a balance between assimilation, right? Uh, I, I belong, I'm part of it. I want to be seen. Others recognize who I am, what I am. Some of that happens very unconscious, almost subconsciously for sure, very little activity is conscious, except every now and then when you look yourself in the mirror and other activities or other situations happen that remind you that you're not in that group, right? They, they come back at you and you go, oh, that's why, that is why, right? That's why that cop ultimately is following me into the grocery store is because there are some perceptions about who I am that I have not even embraced fully, right? And so you want to make sure that that you are there, but yeah, it impacts you. And, and, and I think that part of me is always, man, you wanna, you wanna be bilingual. You, you, you wanna laugh with Jotas, not just with H's. You, you, you guys get that right? It is ha ha ha, not just ha ha ha. You, you wanna embrace it all. You wanna have the duality of it and you wanna have the comprehensiveness of it. You wanna know that hablando español, donde debes hablar español, en el momento que debes hablar español, it's necessary. And that you can switch palante para atrás si eres del Caribe, or perhaps embrace a situation in which you can determine a thesis fully in Spanish without any embracing. So culture manifests itself in so many different ways. Language is the primary transmitter of culture. So you want to know that your language, the way that you speak, not verbally and verbally, has some concrete meanings in that, and that creates some symbolism for others. Embrace it all. Embrace it all. Embrace it all, because that is part of who you are. An anonymous attendee said, how, uh, how has your intersectional identity allow you to begin your racial healing process? Um, uh, for me, that narration storytelling, the part of, man, I'm an immigrant. I, I, I joke around all the time with my kids who are more American, you know, they're from here. They were born here. My kids are born here. My wife was from Dominican Republic. Uh, uh, her descendants are from Dominican Republic, was born in the U.S., grew up in the DR to a degree. But our, our worldview about life you can tell that I'm the immigrant and she's the one that's from here. My kids, you know, we struggle with language at the beginning for them to embrace it fully because obviously school needed to be the, the place in which they needed to do more with them. But, but now they're embracing it even more because the insistence around the intersectionality, the multiplicity of identities that often, oftentimes uh, Latinos have, that Lat Latinx uh, community has, uh, gives us that opportunity. So it heals. Uh, listen to the bachata on Sunday morning, uh, on Saturday morning, and, and perhaps the praise and worship song on Sunday morning uh, provides opportunity for balance, uh, looking for the foods and looking for the opportunities to share for the community, for the meaning, for the symbolism is there. Traveling back to the old country of origin as often as I possibly can, as soon as I could, so that I can ground myself in the reality of that part of who I am and not just be embracing this comfort 
uh, the, of the quote unquote American identity. So I think that, that that helped a lot. What motivates you to continue uh, to do this work when you continue to receive pushback? Um, uh, I determined that I, I am in control of my narrative. I'm in control of my narrative. Pamela, uh, I know that's difficult sometimes to continue to go forward when you just keep getting beating down. That's why this game, quote unquote, is not a solo game. Who's in your team? Who plays with you in this team, in this game of, of, um, of understanding, in this game of motivation, in this game of change, in this game of narrative creation? Lean on that team. Don't do it by yourself. Make sure that you have comrades around you that participate, co-participate in the narrative telling that you have for your life in ways in which it's there. Obviously, as a person of faith, for me, faith is central to my identity, central to my identity. It motivates my social justice. It motivates my relationships. It motivates my, it almost motivates my own self-analysis of who I am in that context. And so you want to, you want to drive that from that particular process and, and drive. Diana Rodriguez Quevedo says, what challenges have you had to overcome? Um, oh my goodness. Let me give you just a practical one there um, in, in so many different ways. Um, you know that, that, that one cultural characteristics, characteristic of, um, of Latinos, particularly Afro-Latinos, Caribbean Latinos in particular, not to generalize or perhaps to create a, a broader generalization here, uh, is that there's a there's a there's a sense of enthusiasm about life, right? And so I, I tend to be in in CEO meetings. I was one. I tend to be in senior leadership meetings. Most of my career I spent it there. And when I speak in those kinds of meetings, I oftentimes preface the following. I preface the listen. It's going to be animated, but it doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> it's going to have emotion and enthusiasm but it doesn't mean it's not true. And so don't confuse my animation without lack of reason or rationality, right? Don't confuse my emotional manifestation with the absence of thought, right? That's important as we continue to do that. So that's, I think that that's, that's important in that process. Give me one second because I'm in a home and now in a home, people are eating around the kitchen. So there's a little noise here if you hear it. Please forgive it if you're there. Okay, I hope that answers your question, uh, Diana. Hopefully, um, that would be that would be there. Hey, there's I see a few names I recognize. Thank you, Diana. What is your recommendation for practicing intergenerational leadership? Recommendations for practicing intergenerational leadership. Number one, make sure that you embrace those who are older than you. <laughs> Embrace their wisdom, embrace their talent, embrace their experience. Don't minimize it. Don't, don't create uh, an interpretation that they're outdated because they are just a little older than you or perhaps from a different generation or a boomer as oftentimes my kids like to call me. So embrace the same for those of you who may be on the older spectrum side of the equation. You want to embrace the talent and the vibrancy of youth and their thinking and their willingness to actually change those systems around them in ways in which we didn't. And so for them to be able to embrace that. And so it takes with that sense of embracing to be able to do that. Come with an open mind, be wise about the opportunities to learn and to cross learn and to share the opportunity there that I think is gonna be an opportunity for you to do that. So I think that those are uh, really important there and again, uh, intergenerational leadership is a position that allows you to do that. As a college student, embrace those around you that are in leadership positions to make sure that you embrace their experience and their wisdom as you continue to build yours. What personal core values do you live by and why? My mantra there, Pamela, is serve without any expectation. Serve without any expectations. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be failed on. You're going to be, uh, you're going to be oftentimes um, uh, extremely disappointed with people's responses. And so to the degree that you can serve without expectations at all times, it gives you freedom to just do, to be, to embrace, to embrace those around you, to embrace the opportunities around you, 
just serve without expectations as best as you possibly can. And there's a question about faith. And so what biblical truth or Bible verse still brings hope, strength, and connection to God's purpose? For me, I leave you with Proverbs 3, 5, 3, 5 through verse 7. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own intelligence, but in all the ways, acknowledge God and God is going to direct your path. That drives me, that connects me, that grounds me with those around me. I bring my team around that concept. And so that is an important opportunity for me there as well. Um, and so I, I embrace those with those with that. Um, excellent. Anything else that can be asked? Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Jada. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, uh, thank you, Francesca. Thank you for the participants that were online. Thank you for the questions. And again, I hope uh, that as you finish today, you do two things. You can give us uh, quick feedback there just by uh, clicking on that uh, or scanning that code. Most importantly, I hope to get a few emails that say, hey, Doc, hey, Edwin, I'm in this, I'm that. This is what's going on. How can you connect me to additional resources that can help me tell a better narrative of where I'm going and who I am? Thank you so much again. Once again, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the opportunity. Cesar, back to you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Estevez. Uh, there is one question in the chat that we overlooked um, by Francesca. She asked, what advice would you give to someone who pushed themselves for years but is experiencing burnout? How do you push past that and having no motivation? Um, take a break. <laughs> disconnect, unplug. Um, you're not a superhero. You're not a superhuman. Uh, you're not, um, um, you're not uh, free from the impact of their expectations, divorcing themselves from the reality that you live. The further away your expectations are from, a re from your reality, the greater the frustrations. The further away your expectations go from your reality, the greater their frustrations. So you have a choice to make. And that choice ultimately is to try to bring balance to those expectations and that reality in which you're in. So take a break, disconnect. Don't be overly heroic in your approaches and your processes. Leave when you need to leave. It's an opportunity for you to self-care enough that you care enough about the issue that you're willing to let it go for a minute literally, and that you can disconnect and recharge in ways in which you have not done so before. This is not a solo sport. It is a team sport. So connect to others. Build relationships around it. When you're burned out, replug yourself into someone else, other people, without draining their energy, but really driving yourself into a recharge mode to make sure that you are pouring what's needed inside of you. But don't believe that because you are done and burn doubt that you need to continue to push forward. You need gas in your tank. Otherwise, the car is not going to work. Thank you so much, Dr. Sennis. Uh, what great information you gave us. Something definitely food for thought, for sure. Um, and I just want to thank, thank you once again on behalf of the Multicultural Center of the University of Southern Indiana. We thank you for being with us today and uh, shedding some light, shedding some wisdom with us. Uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, to those who are still here with us, uh, like Dr. Seva said, uh, uh, scan the QR code, email him if you have any initial questions or comments. Um, and this concludes the, our, our uh, 2021 Latinx Heritage Month keynote speaker. Thank you so much.